Ghana has dropped 30 places on the 2022 World Press Freedom Index. The 2022 index put together by campaign group Reporters Without Borders saw Ghana ranking 60 after placing 30 in 2021. This is Ghana's lowest ever ranking in 17 years after it ranked 66th and 67th in 2005 and 2002 respectively. The latest report is out of 180 countries assert with Ghana recording a decline in it in um, indicative points from 78.67% to 673 compared to last year. Now here on 101, we want to find out the true state of the practice of journalism in Ghana. Is the situation really what is contained in the report and how do we fix it? I am Bryce and I'm here many sitting for your regular host, Bridget Oto. You're welcome to the show. And so I've been joined in the studio by media consultant Liz Heifon Asari, who's going to help me digest this particular topic and ask you to find solutions to our problems as journalists here in Ghana. Welcome to the show. Thank you. So according to the RSF report, although Ghana was considered a regional leader in democratic stability, journalists have experienced growing pressures in recent years. What could be the reason for this particular point raised by the report? I think that is mainly because we are polarized as a nation. and We are polarized down the middle. Um, you can't be objective and not be colored. Um, no matter what you try to do, you'll be colored. And therefore, it behoves on us as journalists to ensure that we are not colored. But it becomes very difficult because if you speak against the ruling party, you're for the opposition. If you speak for the opposition, it means, if you speak against the opposition, it means you're for the ruling party. And that is what has been the bane for so long. And it's, it's cutting deep into our fiber, such that even with the radio stations, you'd realize that um, now there are stations that are owned by political activists, by politicians, and they are the ones who are calling the tunes for those who are working with them, the journalists that are with them. So it's a difficult thing to deal with, but we have to deal with it. Mm. But should all shows be um, geared towards um, having political party represent, um, just to speak of what it makes of a particular issue? No, 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 no. We can, you see, I think that because of the coloration, a lot of people who would come and speak objectively will now shy away because they don't want people coloring them. So you'd end up now getting just those from the political parties coming to speak. Mm. You get a political party activists coming on your shoes. You realize that now of late, a lot of people who have been coming on are mainly MPs. You get MPs, you get um, people from party communication groups coming on. But to get people from outside who have another view, you'd find it very difficult. Isn't it because, quote unquote, they want to say that's what the Ghanaian want to hear, talk about politics. They want to see the MP, the MDC come on the shows and um, talk about problems. They don't know what the Ghanaian want to hear. Um, well, maybe to an extent, but again, because our, our parliament has been reduced to the two parties, um, everything lies now with the two parties, NDC, MPP. So if you are having any discussion um, and you speak against MPP, your NDC, mm. if you speak against NDC, your MPP, there's no middle ground, there's no middle way. Mm. All right, so in the report as well, it states that the Ghanaian journalists um, tends to um, have self-censorship because uh, the government at this time is not really um, cool with criticism. And so mm -hmm. it's intolerant. It's in a report. That's what the report states. Mm -hmm. How do we get here? Difficult question to answer. Um, I think we got here because the media itself is playing politics. Um, I believe that um, coming down the years, you can see there is a trend where certain people speak for certain political parties no matter what. Mm. And I'm talking journalists. I'm talking people in the media who have entrenched themselves in parties. Um, again, you realize that um, over a period of time, you got journalists being picked and put into certain political positions. 
And I think that that, has, that is what has kind of like swayed the media from its stance of objectivity into now choosing sides. Again, where you work, who pays you, has he a lot have. to do with it. Exactly. Has a lot to do with it. So if we do not let the media houses grow by themselves, by making sure that whoever has set it up will only invest in it and whoever has control of it will make sure that the media is working as the media house, we will continue to have this problem. But isn't, isn't this the time where I can say that um, journalists are also humans and they also feel the pains the ordinary Ghanaian or people go through and they live in the country and so they, have, they, they could be able to um, express how they feel. If it's bad, they can say it's bad. If it's good, they can say it's good. Or seeing that actually put you up at a particular uh, political particularist. Um, even if you say it's bad or it's good, what is in your pocket will determine. So if I should work for a media house that is owned by a politician that belongs to a particular party, he definitely does not want me promoting the opposition's views. He would want me promoting the views of the party that he belongs to. And therefore, you can't be as objective as you want to be because where you find yourself uh, puts you in that precarious position. So when you find yourself like that, it's either you continue to stay there because that's where your bread is buttered, mm. or you bow out. But mm. when you bow out, then where are you going? Mm. But that would not be the first time where we have a, a media house um, citing one political party. Even the US, you know the Fox News have yes. their own party to sign with. Yes. But how do we regulate this to ensure that it's not affecting the ordinary Ghanaian and information channeled out for consumption? But interestingly, you'll find out that even with the populists, everybody has the station they want to listen to. Exactly based on what they want to hear. Um, and, and that, again, goes back to which side they belong to. I mean, if, if I want to listen to Oman FM, I probably would want to hear things that are favorable towards the MPP. If I decide to listen to XYZ, I probably will want to listen to things that are favorable to the NDC. So it becomes very difficult. So even the populists have chosen who they want to listen to. And the floating voters that you would find won't tell you who they'll listen to, but they probably will listen to everybody. Mm, those are the ones who really want to make the last minute decisions, if, if I'm correct. Now, let's now talk about the fight for press freedom here in Ghana. If you say press freedom largely, what does it mean? Press freedom, it's just the media operating in that free space where it can be independent. Not, not being overshadowed by government or being dictated to by government, having that kind of freedom to express themselves freely. Um, that basically, to me, is what press freedom is. And therefore, you should have a mind of your own as a media house and wanting to express yourself and making sure that the populists are the ones who are, t who are making the decisions and not you, the media house, making it for them. Mm. Right, and, and now we've seen, we've recorded some cases of um, where pressmen have been attacked or let's say have been jailed here and there because of some odd transit they've made. We've been recorded a death by one of our own, Ahmed Swali, whose case was also cited in the report as one of the reasons why we've declined to the CCF on the ranking. As of now, we are still looking for the murders of, 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 of Ahmed Swali. Is that not worrying enough? It is worrying, but is he the only one who has been murdered that? The murder hasn't been solved. I want to look at a border. Let's put journalists in perspective. OK. So if you're talking journalists, then there have been a few. I think there was, um, I'm trying to remember the names. We come back to that when, when, yes. when you're able to. My, my phone names. is off. If I, get, if I get my phone on, I'll be able to get some of, some of the names. But we've had quite a few journalists, maybe three or four, who have been murdered. The murders have not been solved up to now. Again, it puts you, the journalist, in a frightening position because then your safety is at stake. If a journalist is shot and nothing is done about it, then you ask yourself, what would I do that would cause people to come after me? Um, when I was studying journalism and when I started reporting, I had lecturers and my editors who, to who told me that there's no story that is worth dying for, mm. you know? So 
Um, why would you want to put yourself in the line of fire just because you're doing a certain work? Is that not because you want so, to you want to un unravel the truth and nothing but the truth? Possibly, but if you die, will the truth get un unraveled? If you die before the work is complete, will the truth be unraveled? It wouldn't. So you need to keep yourself alive. So we need to be able to be careful, but we also need to be safe. And I think that it not, does not behove on the journalist per se to create that environment for safety. It takes everybody, especially the ruling government, the executive, to ensure that the environment is safe, that people can speak their mind freely without being threatened. You have a few people who have spoken their mind and you realize that they were harassed or they were beaten or they were assaulted, not only by, by activists or foot soldiers, but by security agencies. Mm. And the security agencies, I keep saying that they are, their primary role is to the state and not to the executive. So they should be protecting journalists, but we are not seeing it today. Why? Because everybody wants to dance to the tune of who is in power. I want to ask you this question. And, uh, I mean, you mentioned that uh, Ahmed Swallow wouldn't be the first journalist to have been murdered in line of duty. Let's yeah. take you away from Ghana. Kajoki, he was um, yeah. cut into pieces yeah. and uh, dumped in acid for the body to melt and later uh, trashed in tank, a uh, septic tank and all that. Very worrying. But the question is, should we say that it's normal and so it should be expected? No, it's not. It's not normal. Nothing, nothing, um, <laughs> I don't know how to express it, but I think that Nothing of that sort, no assault on a journalist should be seen as normal. It's not normal. It is just that um, we have gotten to a place where people are operating with impunity. Mm. And therefore, they think that they can get away with doing certain things. And therefore, there have been serious attacks on journalists. And what has happened? Nothing. Are we expecting too much from the government? Is that our problem? Our problem is that we're not even looking out for each other as journalists. As journalists, we are not even looking out. How should we be doing that? Um, I don't know. If you ask me, I think that we need to be sitting around the table to do some discussion. But I would have expected the Ghana Journalist Association, the National Media Commission, to be up in arms and to be fighting for journalists, to be calling journalists out when they do bad and when they do good, to be making sure that when people are attacking journalists left, right, center, they, that stones are not left unturned. You go right down to the end to make sure that we get to good conclusions as to what is happening and make sure that the journalists are safe. But even the JJ itself is not up and running like it used to be. The mm. JJ itself has its own challenges and has its own problems. And so when some of these things happen, they reluctantly put out a statement, probably of condemnation. After that, what do they do? You that makes it more scary. Exactly. That makes it uh, And it, make, it makes me want to ask you, will there ever be an end to press freedom? Um, if we are going to end press freedom, then we are going back into the culture of silence. I don't think in Ghana we want to go back there, where people can't express themselves, where people can't say anything when it's going wrong or whether it's going right, um, where people can't freely talk about issues and think that they can contribute to issues that um, pertains to their well-being. It becomes very difficult. So no, we don't want to end up where there'll be no press freedom. With this report and with what we've been seeing in, in the past few years, are we not almost heading towards that line? Um, um, hmm, I, wa I want to be optimistic. Be, you, 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 you can go on and do that. that. I want to be optimistic and hope that because it has come out this way, and you realize that the, the executive is uncomfortable with this report, so they're trying to put out all kinds of um, excuses or all kinds of explanations to it. I hope that they start working to make sure that um, we get back to the status that we were before. We have been first in Africa. Why should we fall down to 60th? Um, I listened to them talk about the methodology changing. But even with the methodology changing, some countries that were worse than Ghana have done far better than they did before. And I, I, I keep asking myself, so if the methodology, methodology changed and we did better, our ranking was better, would we be facing the same thing? 
would we be complaining about the methodology? Mm. So it, it has nothing really to do with the method that was used um, to whether quantitative or qualitative, whatever it was used to um, gather the information. It has nothing to do with it. That's what you're saying. I'm saying that even if it has to do with that, we could have even been better if we had kept to the fact that we were operating a free um, and open media, free and open press, easy to express themselves without being harassed, within, without being assaulted, without being attacked. That is the main bane. Again, our economic situation as journalists, as media houses, with regards to media investments, is rather very low. We are, doing, we are doing a lot of lip service and not actual work, Minister. Mm. The space has to do with our practice. It has to do with um, how well we rate ourselves. It has to do with how the government perceives us or the executive perceives us and works with us. It has to do with um, the legal framework within which we are working. Is it okay? Could it be better? Mm. Um, as journalists ourselves, how responsible are we? Are we that responsible such that people won't want to be throwing stones at us because they know that we've done our work and done it well without fear or favor, not picking on any side, but doing exactly what we have to do? All these things come into play and all these things are things that we should be looking at. Again, I think that the journalistic body is not one. We are not standing together. We are not united as journalists. Mm. Even in general, even as, even, I was saying to somebody today that even the GJ is polarized. If you look at the situation now where the current president should have been off um, the presidency, we should have had elections by now, yet there is some wrangling somewhere when you want journalists to sign a petition to make sure that the proper things are done. You can't even get 100 journalists signing such a petition. Then you ask yourself, what is wrong with us as journalists? Out of 700 plus of us, you can't get 100 to sign a petition. Why? Because they are not willing to. Why? Because they think that what is, is what should stand. Mm. There's another point in the report that I find really worrying. And um, let me read that. It says, the spread of rumors, propaganda, and disinformation has contributed to undermining journalism and access to quality information. Um, I, I want to... I want to ask you this, I mean, propaganda, the spread of false information. How do you blame a journalist for the spread of false information? How is that my fault as a journalist? Um, I guess that it won't be only the journalist. I think that social media has come to contribute that, to that a lot. Um, a lot of people can put anything on social media, can report anything that they find on social media without checking. And I think that that also is another problem. We don't cross-check. We put half-baked stories. We don't put balanced reports. Um, in my time of reporting, my report would never come out if I hadn't spoken to two sides or if I hadn't balanced my story. If there were three sides to that story, the editor would expect me to speak to everybody mm -hmm. concerned before I come out with a report. Otherwise, my report won't see the light of day. Today, as a result of sensationalism, we just put half-baked things out there. And people, the first thing that they hear is what they believe. That is what they run with. And so it has become a problem for us as journalists. So you're asking why should journalists be blamed? Journalists should be blamed because we are not going down to the end of the story. We are not looking for the truth. We are just putting out what comes to us. We live in a century where social media is almost like the end game. Each and every one wants to go on social media to even um, um, puts um, how do I, to, to be able to say that yeah, the story is true or not. I mean, once they see on social media on some blogs, which they find to be um, good, they, they believe that the story is true, and it comes back to the journalist in the media house to ensure that the story is either corrected or published as it is. What should we be doing to ensure that such stories that we find online, because it goes a very long way, transmitting from a particular place to other has its own limitations. I, I, don't, I don't think, I, I'm wondering how many stations here in Ghana can transmit their, um, their programs from Ghana to, let's say, Ivory Coast or Togo. But on social media, no matter where you are, it's easier for you to know what exactly is happening at a, a different place and all that. How do we fix this? We all, have, we all have seen that a lot of the media houses have online, have online um, 
publications. Again, you see that a lot of the media now have Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all those things. So when you have, when you have them, you realize that this, this, um, the space should be monitored by the media houses, but they are not. So stories come in, and because they are sensational, and because they would make them popular, or make them, um, should I say, open, open to people listening, or people watching them, they let it go. So sensationalism is gradually creeping in, and that is what is causing a lot of the problem. Mm, but it makes me want to take it back to where we say that. Is that not what the Ghanaian want? Because now you go on blogs and you realize that the chunk of people they're waiting to follow a particular person or a particular statement is huge. Rather than seeing, how many people watch the news of late? I would say that when you go on social media, when you look at the online, it's the Ghanaians that are outside the country who patronize that a lot. So then you're spreading to a wider Ghanaian public. Because I don't think that the English out there is interested in the kind of entertainment we have. Exactly. They're not interested in the kind of gossip that we are putting out there. You know, it is the Ghanaian outside that is interested in it. But we should do it in such a way that we are giving them the correct information. If we don't, then definitely we'll have problems. All right. And I'm still here um, with Madam Lise, and we are talking about press freedom. What proper way can we ensure that we are maintaining our freedom as pressmen, um, journalists? We, we know uh, the new ranking, uh, putting Ghana at the 60th, uh, all the way from 30th. Quite worrying. I mean, a lot of discussion has been going about. I'm joined in the studio by Liz, uh, Madam Liz Heifron. Uh, she is a media marketer. And we are talking ways and means by which this problem can be fixed. Just watching us here on 101. I am Bright. I'm in here. Quick 10. We'll be back. Thank you for staying with us and welcome back to 101. I'm still here with um, Liz Heifron Asari, who is a media marketer. We are talking about press freedom. I'll also taking a look at what exactly um, the new release by um, uh, press men everywhere have actually done with the report Ghana being placed at the 60th position all the way from 30th. We've dropped to the 60th. Quite worrying. Um, so just when we're on break, you were telling me about some names of persons whose cases are still hanging and um, no one yet has been brought to book when it comes to yes, the murder of there's, journalists. There's, there's an ending, I think, in 2007 who was murdered, I think, in Kumasi. Um, we haven't seen an end to that. There's Georgia Banga who was murdered in 2015. Um, we haven't seen an. Actually, there have even there there even no updates as to where the what case is, is exactly at the moment. And the same with Ahmed Swale. Um, we keep getting assurances that services are working to make sure that perpetrators are brought to book. But we realize that perpetrators are not being brought to book. I remember, um, is it Gabi who was attacked when he went to the courts by, by party activists? I'm sure um, even in that time, you probably saw some of the perpetrators. Nobody picked them up, nobody did nothing. You know, and it keeps going on. Um, um, Caleb from, from City TV, he was picked up and everything. We saw exactly what happened. What did we do as journalists? We just sat back and watched. Apart from his station bosses who went and fought to get him out, what did journalists as a group do? What, what should we be doing um, we as should a group? Be should we be demonstrating? Together. I don't think it only comes to demonstrating. Um, demonstrating is just one of the ways we can deal with it. I believe that if we have good leaders in our journalism front, there are things that can be addressed. We don't? Do we address them? No. Why? Because we probably have taken sides. And probably we'll sit down and say, it serves him right. Why did he go and do what he did? And you mentioned and if, then, if then, we have, and if then, we had. And then, and then uh, they will tell you that journalism comes with responsibility. It does. But even, even if you're being irresponsible, is the result assault? Mm. Don't we have laws that deal with journalists? Don't we have civil libel? Don't we have um, other civil actions that, that can be taken against journalists. 
Must it result in assault? Must it result in slapping some journalists? Must it result in destroying the equipment that they work with that are very expensive that you won't even give back? Is that the way we want to go? Another point is also the fact that even we as journalists uh, now have to pay for some information. With the RTA and all that, you still have to pay for uh, a certain amount of money to be able to even get some information and all that. It's also back in the, in the, in the conversation. I mean, you, you are against smiling about this. When, when you talk about the RTI and the information that you're getting and the information that you're paying for, you're only paying for um, the transmitting of the information. So if you go to an institution and you want the information hard copy, and they probably have to do a 100-page photocopy for you, you pay for the paper on which they are printing. Why do you have to it's print for me? One, it's digitalized. Can't you just send to me by email? So then, so then even that, even that it makes it easier for you. If they're sending it to you electronically, what are you going to pay for it? Unless you have, they probably have to download it onto something. Information in itself is not for sale because the information has been generated by the taxpayer's money already. So the institutions do not own the information does not belong to them, it belongs to the taxpayer. So they have to release it. But then again, the act has come into force and you're not seeing journalists use it the way we expect that journalists will use it. They're always giving excuses and when we went there. So now they're information officers. Go to the information officer, ask for the information. People are saying that um, when you go 14 days, no, you can ask for information and uh, uh, um, a request of agency, and you should be able to get it if it is information that should be given you, if it is not exempt. If it is not exempt, is it, your, it is your right to be able to have that information. We are waiting to see how journalists are using the act to make sure that they get information as quickly as they want, to give us better stories. Mm. And that would open us up, because then institutions will be forced to be transparent. And when you are transparent, definitely it will have an effect on corruption because now people can't hold on to the information and ask you to pay so much for it before you can get it. So let us use the act and get the information that we need. And those who are not willing to give the information will be penalized by the commission because the law gives the commission that right. You speak so passionately about the, uh, the journalism practice and all of that. I know you've gone to some other countries to train journalists and all that, and here in Ghana, you've, you are a journalist yourself and all that. Tell us, what is it that we are doing so different from what is being practiced out there? Um, should I say there's anything different? Uh, I don't think that there's much difference. I, I think that it's, it's the way that we, we are relating. Like I said, that um, every country has, has its own journalist and and where they stand. Um, when I came into journalism, there was no pluralism. It was state-owned media only. So um, you have state-owned media behaving as if they are doing a public service. And so you realize that because it was just them, they could get adverts easily and things like that. Then. We had media pluralism, and then you have all these TV stations, and I think there are about 400 plus media organizations in the country today. I think that the space is too small for our space in Ghana is too small for 100, 400, and you know um, it's not written anywhere, but you see subtle ways in which certain media houses are staffed of, of finance. Because a lot of the money media houses raise is through adverts. Mm. Um, government has decided that it won't place certain adverts in certain media organizations. So only other certain media organizations will get that. And then you have um, people in the private sector who probably, because these media houses have grown and have that recognition, would use those media houses instead of using the lesser ones because the lesser ones to them won't go far mm. and they want to make the maximum out of their investment. So you realize that it's just the same media houses that are getting the sponsorship, that are getting 
the advent, that, and that adds to the economics of the growth of the media in Ghana. So you definitely would have only a part growing because they are the ones who are seen as being up in the front and being prominent, and they are the ones that are being used. Mm. You mentioned that, I mean, we are too small uh, to have as this large number of uh, media houses here in the country, over 400. I mean, uh, what, what would be the appropriate number if you should recommend a particular number of media houses here in Ghana? I can't do that. I can't, I can't re recommend a, um, a particular number. But I think that the NCA probably has an idea or probably should do a survey to kind of come out with um, zoning the country and making sure that um, we have that kind of media that would, would fit into our space. Right now, as it is, you see that when a particular party is in power, then their affiliates or their representatives or those who do business with them are the ones who are getting stations. So you see so many MPP um, back stations in the in NPP regime. You see so many NDC back station in NDC regime. And that's the way it has been going. And everybody thinks that they should be able to be in that space. We want to speak freely. Kebi mamin kebi. But even when you do that, you're not allowing people to speak freely. Mm. So then... Yes, it's, it's a democratic state, but then <laughs> how democratic is the state? I'm just asking. And also another thing is, would you also recommend that stations affiliated to political parties are clamped down on? No. So, so that we just have, I mean, stations that um, work, they're neutral. They don't, they, don't, they, don't, they don't work for any political party. We don't have to um, have this station A or station B, some foreign people or foreign DC or CPP or whichever political party. Should we have just neutral media houses it working? It is possible to have a station owned by a political party that is operating objectively and openly. It should uh, be possible. How, how possible is that? Uh -huh. You see, currently, we don't see it as possible. Because if you're in that station and you're not working for the person who has employed you because that station is what is giving you your bread and butter, then you have a problem. But if we have general managers, managing directors, who are being objective, who are making sure that um, whatever they're doing is, does not favor A, does not favor B. And I want to say that if I want to cite um, a station that I think is coming out of that and being very objective, I probably will call City. City will hit you hard and hit you soft when and where it is necessary. Joy is trying to claw back its old image of making sure that it's being objective and being outright. You know, Metro is also doing the same. But if we have those stations that can do that and yet are being owned by politicians. But, but how do I employ you and you tell me you're going to go against me? <laughs> how do you do that? How do you... That will be a piece on your own head. You see, so why do you employ me and expect that I should, I should be in tune with you. So this one so, to ask the question. Should so we, then, mm. you wait, hold on a minute. So then if, if you're going to employ me, are you going to find out whether um, an MPP sympathizer or an NDC sympathizer before you employ me? I mean, if, if the party, is, if the station is um, politically maintained and um, established and all that, definitely they might want to take people who believe in the ideologies. Exactly. And that is where the problem lies. So it shouldn't behove on who owns the, the station to do the employing. If you employ somebody who you think is competent to run your station, because they're doing the station as a business. You know, so, and if you're doing it as a business, then you want everybody to, to tune into your station. You want to have a wider number of people listening to you, because the more people that you have listening to you, as a station, the better for us as a nation. But if you want to hold on because you have a certain political leaning, you're shooting yourself in the foot because then you won't have that kind of audience that you really want. You'd have just the people who are with you. Should journalists be declining office given to them by 
uh, media houses affiliated to political parties? Should that be the case? When we get there, can we say that boldly that we are now being very neutral and just with our reportage? I, it, it's, it's, it's difficult for, for me to say. I haven't worked in any of the media, private media houses yet. But I, I believe that when I worked in Ghanaian Times, I tried to be as objective as possible, even though people did not like it. I tried hard to stay my ground. And sometimes you're tagged. Sometimes they will tell you that, oh, you're MPP because you're talking a certain way. Or they'll tell you that you're NDC. It didn't bother me then. It doesn't bother me now. So how were you able to um, find a way through all these criticisms and still be able to push out your stories? I just speak my mind. My story just has to be the truth. It has to be fact. Once it was factual, once it was the truth, once it was accurate, it was brief, it was clear, it will see the light of day. There are certain times where um, my stories were some, maybe sometimes tweaked a little by my editors certain way. I'm like, no, then take my byline off. I don't want my byline on the story. And it, it becomes a contention between you and your editor or your sub-editor. But when you stand your ground, they probably understand you. Another concern for me when I was in Times was when I saw a change of, of, of uh, government, ruling party from right left uh, Rawlings to Kofu, then all of a sudden I saw that the core that covered Rawlings was brought in in a different core and I was, my question was, why are you pulling these ones out and putting these ones in? But then again, you see, it's because in the newsroom, your editor or your news editor has probably studied you and seen where, where your affiliation lies. But I didn't think that it was right. I thought that if we had a press corps that was attached to the presidency, it didn't matter which president was in power, it should have stayed. And it's still happening. We know that any time there is change in government, some of the pressmen are actually pulled away and others are brought to him. Is it because they want to pull, put out an agenda? I mean, all of these contribute to how bad journalism must have now has been. So I told you that we are polarized as a media ourselves, and so we don't back each other. Because if we did, we won't be doing things like that. If we did, we would just allow people who were good and we could trust in their reportage to go out and bring us the story. Someone told me, how do I, how do I write the truth when I'm hungry? <laughs> how, how do I write the truth when I'm hungry and the lie is staring in my face with a huge amount of money on the table? How do I say I'm telling the truth and I'm hungry? How do I do that? How, how do you keep a conscience when you're lying all the time? How do you feel within yourself when you're lying, when you know that what you're putting out is not the truth? Even if you're hungry. How do you go to sleep knowing that you have deceived 30 million people? So we don't have a conscience anymore. Just think of what is good for ourselves. And when you do that, then definitely we are going down as a country. Because if we, as the fourth estate of the realm, are supposed to put those who are governing us on their toes, and we are thinking of ourselves and what will make us better and what will make us feel good. And we are not helping the nation. Probably that is why we are where we are. Mm. So can we, can we go back to Media House and say that if, if you don't pay me this amount of money um, and I'm not satisfied and I go out there and I'm being lured into writing a particular story because I've been promised a particular car or a house or money, then I take it because, I mean, if I come back to the office, how much am I going to be paid at the end of the month? So should we go back to the media houses then? You see, um, for some of us back then, we looked up to those who would write the stories and would write the truth. And I remember where one particular journalist says that there's no way you can buy me. I'm not up for sale. You know, That's so, pure integrity. Yes. And that is what would ride you. That was what would keep you on your feet. I keep saying that sometimes I went to bed hungry, but I felt satisfied. So would I go to bed hungry and satisfied because I've done what is right? Or I'll go to bed with a full stomach and guilt that I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do. So the choice is up to the person. 
And I believe that as journalists, we must be true to ourselves first. You can't be true to anybody if you're not true to yourself. And that is what makes me cringe when people describe us as stomach journalists. It means that you're thinking of yourself only. What happens to the outside world, you don't care. But our care is to make sure that the government is kept on its toes, that we are transparent as a people, that we are working towards bringing corruption down, that we are working towards making sure that our country develops and we stand united instead of polarized. In the end, you will reap because you have sown on good ground. Right. And, and, and another, another thing here too is that there's been conversation about the fact that um, we have a lot of people coming from journalism schools, but then uh, when they are done, they, they have no place to work because these same media houses will choose to employ those who have the fine fees or let's say they are popular on social media or somewhere to be on screen rather than the person might have gone to school to learn the ethics and what exactly it means to be a journalist. Now, where do you belong? Do you belong to the school of thought that says, let's only employ those who go to the journalism school, or let's go out there and find some people with a pretty face, just because we, we can sell what we are giving out to the public? I think that there have been some excellent journalists who have learned on the job. So, um, people can learn on the job and be good. But right now, is that the space that we are working in? A lot more people are going into school and coming out. But not everybody who is coming out of school can be as practical as you want them to be. Interestingly, when I went to GIJ and I left GIJ and went to Graphic, I could write a story on my own. Is it the same today? Are they doing the kind of internship that we did? Well, I don't know because I haven't gone back to GIJ in a while. But I believe that we should have that kind of training that brings you out when you're well-groomed to be able to sit before the camera and to really present. Um, you realize that sometimes when, when people are doing interviews or you're listening to people reporting, you get tired because they keep repeating the same things over and over and over again. And then the question is, were they really trained? Because if you're not really trained, there is a setting, I don't know what to call it, there's a certain polishing to those who have been trained as journalists. Is it, is it an X factor? That you, that you won't get from somebody who has just come off the street. Unless the person has worked in the institution maybe for a while, then they would know the ins and the outs of it. When you come out of journalism school and you go into a media house, it is easier for you to pick the house style than for somebody who has been brought out of the street. Somebody who has been brought off the street will have to go through a lot more training than you who have gone through school. And I kept asking myself, you won't have anybody practicing law if the person hasn't gone to law school, if the person hasn't passed the bar exam. Are, are you saying that we've cheapened you, the practice? I'm not, saying, I'm not saying that we've cheapened the practice. What I'm saying is that we haven't paid much attention to those who are trained. We haven't grown journalism to the, the stage where you can say that I won't just pick anybody off the street and put the person in front of a microphone to speak. We haven't done that. We need to do that. I, will, I would even be happier because if you look at a lot of the professions, surveyors, engineers, architects, lawyers, doctors, when they come out after training, they have to do a particular exam before they can regard themselves as professionals in that field. In journalism is not like that. You know, we know that doctors have to go to school for six years, seven years, and on a specific number of years to be trained properly. Later, they come out and they know that, yes, it's a doctor. But then journalism, even, we have six even, months. Even those who are trained on the job don't go through any kind of examination to make sure that they are qualified to be able to be practicing our profession. The fact that they've been there for a long time just qualifies them to practice. And therefore, you get people who are not professionals, who are not well-trained practicing journalism then you want to question. And so journalists are put in a blanket. So whether you've been trained or you have not been trained, you're all looked at the same. Mm. Let, me, let, me, let me give you another scenario, a conversation I have with somebody, and a person tells me that 
Um, he also had a, a, a conversation with another person, a media owner, and he was told that, I mean, hiring somebody who has no idea about journalism or has been to school for just about six months or two months to be trained about journalism is cheaper than going for somebody who has, I mean, gone through the mill, the four-year degree, the two-year diploma, the whole master thing and all that to be a properly built, trained journalist because they will come in and demand more rather than somebody that they just saw on the street and they think the person is handsome or beautiful to grade the screens. So they're always going for people like that because it's cheaper. And when it gets cheaper, it gets dangerous. Yeah. What should that we be is doing? Our being. That, that is our being. I mean, they don't want to pay journalists well, so they'll pick anybody to do anything. And that's why you'd have people wanting to assault journalists because they probably don't like what you're saying because you're sitting and you're speaking in, in somebody else's favor. If you're trained, you'll be more careful. If you're trained, you'll be more in tune with what to look out for and what to publish and what to put on air. If you're trained, you'll be better able to carry yourself and make sure that you keep the integrity of your profession and yourself, you know? But because we don't do that, anybody does anything and gets away with it. Right. And, uh, and also, I, I want to ask you, how do we save these persons? How do we make sure that we are soon to get the good ones? I guess that with, with, with every institution, recruitment is a very important factor. When, if, if you want very good people in your institution, you go through rigorous um, recruitment exercises. And so if you are, you are well qualified, then you probably will be chosen. Right now, you have people who bring you all kinds of CVs. And when you look at the CV and you tell them that, oh, no, I don't think I can employ you. This is the quality of people I'm looking for. Then it becomes a problem for everybody because they're seeking favors. And you have people who know people who go and seek employment for you because they think that you must be employed. Let's look for quality mm. in journalism. Let's look for quality. Let's no. make sure that quality is in the forefront. Great. Let, let's now turn our heads and talk about investigative journalism. Now, on, on the issue of press freedom, how should the relation between pressmen and government really be? A relationship. Yes. Hmm. And the, isn't the press or isn't the media the watchdog? Aren't they supposed to keep the government on their toes, ask the necessary questions that would feed the population in making proper decisions, taking proper decisions, making sure that um, the choices that we have and the choices that we're making, we're making as a result of um, information that we have had, true information, factual information knowing the truth and standing by the truth and making sure that when we take decisions and when we make choices, we are making choices because they are the right choices that we should make. And if we do that, then definitely we will probably be moving forward as a country in leaps and bounds. So the government should be open, should be transparent, but the journalists also should be probing and should be going in to look for exactly what would help us develop as a nation, rather than just thinking that we should satisfy ourselves and sit back and watch what is going on. Mm. We should be a little more pushy. We should be a little more um, investigative, if I should use the word. We should be a little more wanting to come to the truth and bring the truth to the fore so people know exactly what they have and what they're doing. If you want to make informed choices and you're not open and you don't put out information, then people will just choose because you, you are able to lure them to believe in what you're telling them. Mm. A journalist has more work to do. This makes me want to take you back to um, the theme of this year's World Press Freedom Day into the, the discussion as now. And it says that digital search or the rise of digital uh, authoritarianism is this era indeed a search. <laughs> um, is it really a search? Um, 
I think that digitalization has brought with it its pros and its cons. Um, so definitely you get some information, but you won't get all. But we need to probe further to make sure that we get all the information. We need to come out at a time where we can put very balanced stories and not make up the, 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 the audiences or the, our targets' minds for them. Let us give them the information so that they can make up their minds and make, and make their own choices. The media has, gone to, to, has come to a stage where we have become very opinionated, so we bring it to bear in our stories. So by the time you finish reading the story, you know the way the journalist is thinking, you know what conclusion you must come to, and they flow by that. But if we just give them the facts and leave them to make up their minds, if information is out there, if we are very open, you realize that we'll be able to make better choices as a people. And how has this surge affected uh, traditional media? Mm. And who are you calling traditional media in this instance? Let, let's talk about the, the TV stations and the radio stations. Uh, and let's, let's put the new media as social media platforms. Mm. You see, um, because people want information as quickly as it comes, you have a lot more people um, probably moving towards the new forms of media that we have. And that is because it's like it's faster, it's catching on, that is where the youth is probably always on their laptops, on their phones, where they can get news quickly. As it is happening, it is unfolding. As, as opposed to um, waiting to listen to the news at 7 o'clock. Um, somebody was telling me about the Laboni Junction accident even before it had broken. And why? Because a friend had sent pictures on their phone. And that is the trend that is going today. So we need to make sure that even our traditional media outlets are up and doing. Not many of our stations today can report on, on the scene. I mean, a lot of us still go and then take notes and go back and have to go and write the story. With the TV and radio stations, it's even a little easier. They can report as it is unfolding. Yeah. With other media, it's not the same. So if we are not um, willing to upgrade to meet what the, the, what the world today is asking for, then we are being left behind. So the traditional media also has to build that capacity to be able to report from the scene. Uh, would that not be a blow for newspapers? Oh, news, <laughs> news, it is a, a blow for newspapers, yes. Um, newspapers now, people hardly read newspapers. And so newspapers have to resort to doing those kind of stories that are interest stories, human interest stories that people will want to get the newspaper for. Mm. Much as TV would be on the scene, probably shooting maybe an Independence Day parade. I could do a color story that nobody has seen mm. because I have been present, I am present on the scene and I am seeing what is going on, what is happening. You might be watching on TV, but probably on TV you're paying attention to certain particular things that would probably be off. You won't see what is off camera. You'd only see what the reporter is showing yeah. you, what the cameraman is showing you. I, as a reporter in the place, would see things that are going around. I can use that to do a story that will still keep the people interested in my newspaper. Great. I want us to wrap up there. I'm going to ask you one last question. You can actually put it together with your, um, your remarks. Quickly, how do media houses or how can media houses protect the bravery and professionalism of their, of their workers? Hmm. Let's conclude our conversation with this. How do you protect the bravery? Takes me back to my editor. Yeah. <laughs> Christian Agri would protect you no matter what. He would not give you up as his journalist easily. Um, I think that there were people like that in the past. Sam Clegg was the one. You had others. Avanugo of uh, DNA. You had people in GBC. I mean, you had editors of great you know, who would stand behind their journalist? No matter what. No matter what. Um, today, we probably are too quick to give up our journalists, especially when they're picked. 
then we want to call people in power instead of going to face themselves. Yeah. And if you look at Caleb's case, when he was picked up, his MD and his general manager did not sit down. They followed. Did, did that give you any, any, any signal? Of what? After how the operations are. You know, um, if you have a journalist that is worth his salt, you definitely would defend him because you know that he won't do anything untoward. And therefore, you would stand up for them. But like I said, we don't stand up for each other. I want to believe that there are other people who might have called in to city to commiserate with whatever was happening. Yeah. The same at Happy FM when it happened. Did they? I don't know. It will be interesting to know if when something happens to um, you at Metro TV, would I pick up a phone and call? I say, no, I, I know the guy. He can't do this. He can't do that. Will you do that? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what would you make of um, government's reaction on the murder of journalists in Ghana, how journalists are even brutalized or even um, manhandled? You see, and um, I, said, I, said, I probably said it, or I probably alluded to it in the beginning. When government is seen to do nothing other than condemn, it raises questions. It even raises further questions when it's state agencies that are perpetrating um, the assault, the harassment. If activists are perpetrating assault on journalists, people are seeing and nobody's reacting, then you ask questions. Because I should think that the citizenry should be concerned about journalists and journalists' welfare. If Somebody is beating up a journalist, and you, as a citizen, are standing and watching. And yet, it is the journalist that you rely on to get the information you need to be able to earn your daily bread. Why would you stand and watch? Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for time this year on Thank 101. You. So, Liz Hifunasari is a media marketer, and I'm bright. That's it for today here on 101.